In a prior video, we talked about wrestlers who, for one reason or another, never managed to succeed in WWE. But World Wrestling Entertainment isn't the only place where great performers have failed, as the exact same thing happened many times in WCW. But what are the biggest examples of wrestlers totally flopping in this once great promotion? Well, that's exactly what we are going to be looking at today. And where better to start than with arguably their biggest fumble of all, Bret Hart. Just place yourself in Eric Bischoff's mind in 1997. Your company is red hot, you're trouncing WWF in the ratings, and the biggest angle in the industry's history since the Mega Powers is about to reach its climax. How can you go any higher? Well, by bringing in the Hitman, someone who's just left the WWF in a wave of controversy and who is now more over than anyone else out there because of this. Yes, it seemed like a situation which was impossible to screw up. After all, not only was Brett the most talked about person in wrestling in the winter of 1997, but he was also still arguably the best in the world. It's just a shame that when Bischoff did bring him on board then, he'd proceed to do absolutely nothing with him. Seriously, there's dropping the ball and then there's the way the excellence of execution was booked down in Atlanta. It honestly boggles the mind how something could be executed so poorly. And it all began on night one when, rather than coming across like the hero coming to save Sting from getting screwed like he had, the botched nature of the finish to the Hogan-Sting match meant Brett just looked like a fool. Still, had he been pushed into a good program after that, then this might have been forgiven. Sadly though, for the next year, the Hitman was wasted in nothing feuds that continually went nowhere. Of course, many people say that at the time, Brett had lost any passion he had once had, so there was no way he could be rocketed to the top of the card. But whether this was true or not, the fact remains WCW let any heat the Canadian had whimper away to the point that, when he finally did win the big one in 1999, no one cared anymore. And to make matters worse, it was only a short time after this that the Hitman would suffer a series of concussions over a short space of time, with such injuries leading to him being forced to retire. Still, for as bad as this run was, at least Hart got to hold the gold for a while and feel like something of a threat. But when it comes to his former tag team partner and real-life brother-in-law Jim Neidhart, the same, unfortunately, cannot be said. No, in the case of the Anvil, he'd flop so badly in WCW that it's easy to forget he was ever there at all. But he was throughout the majority of 1998. Of course, during this time he'd do almost nothing of note, only taking part in random tag team matches with little consequence. And on the few occasions he did get to mix it up in singles action, it would always be against a no-name jobber. So why was he signed at all then? Was it just an example of WCW flexing their huge checkbook and signing another ex-WWF talent who they thought they could steal away? Or was it nothing more than a favor to Bret Hart, as following the events of the Montreal Screwjob, he probably wanted as many of his family members around him as possible? In truth, the answer is likely a little of both. So perhaps it's no surprise WCW never really had any intention of doing something with Neidhart. Still though, even if he was a family member of Brett, this wouldn't be enough to keep the Anvil employed by WCW for long, because once it became clear they saw no real value in him, he'd eventually be cut before the year was out. And so like that, the sad saga of one of the limpest world championship wrestling runs ever ended. Perhaps even limper than our next entry, another Hart family member, the British Bulldog. Now, we can almost understand Jim Neidhart not making a big splash in Atlanta, as he was never a huge star in his own right. Rather, he was always someone who worked better alongside a bigger name. In the case of Davey Boy Smith, though, he had a huge amount of potential to be a main event level player, particularly if the company were hoping to expand further into the UK market. After all, back in the 90s, the Bulldog was pretty much a god to British wrestling fans. Need we remind you about the time he headlined Wembley Stadium in 1992 over the likes of Macho Man Randy Savage, The Ultimate Warrior, and Ric Flair? So there's no reason he shouldn't have been a major player in the main event scene of WCW once he was signed up there in late 1997. Unfortunately though, this appears to have been another case of Eric Bischoff doing Bret Hart a favor by bringing his brother-in-law on board rather than him signing Smith as he thought he could do something with him. Really, is it any surprise WCW went out of business a few years after this? After all, they had so much great talent whom they let go to waste, and the British Bulldog was one of the bigger examples of this. Even if he wasn't going to be treated like a main eventer, he could have still served a role as a key mid-card act, maybe a United States champion. But instead, he'd spend a large portion of his time there stuck in a go-nowhere tag team with Jim Neidhart. Hell, they weren't even able to win the tag team titles. That's right, 
Davy Boy would never really get an opportunity to fully show what he was capable of in WCW. And it's not like he was even an old man either, like many of the former WWF stars that joined WCW, as he was only in his mid-30s and really should have been in the prime of his career at this point. Unfortunately though, the Bulldog would be reduced to mainly appearing on sea shows like Thunder, with the company never giving him any real storylines or angles he could sink his teeth into. But wait, it gets worse, because like with the Hitman, Davy Boy would also suffer a catastrophic injury in a WCW ring which severely hampered his ability to work after that. That's right, it all happened when, at Fall Brawl in 1998, no one informed him ahead of time that there was a trap door under the ring which the Ultimate Warrior was later going to use to make a surprise entrance. So thinking the mat was fully safe then, the Bulldog would take a bump during his bout that night. The only problem with this bump was that it saw him land right on the metal frame of the door, nearly crippling him in the process. And after this, the Bulldog would be released from WCW altogether. Surely it couldn't have been any worse for our next subject then, right? Well, while he may not have gotten physically injured while down south, his run was so bad it did more than a little damage to his ego. That's right, it's time to talk about the Ultimate Warrior. Now in the late 80s and early 90s, Jim Helwig was one of the most over wrestlers on the entire planet. Hell, so over was he, he was actually booked to pin Hulk Hogan clean at WrestleMania 6 and become the new WWF champion in the process. That said, with his antics outside the ring being so notorious that even CM Punk would have to sit him down and tell him he's going a little too far, it's no surprise he'd end up getting himself fired from WWF on multiple occasions. Not that this was a huge deal to him though, especially not in 1998, as by then WCW was still flying high. And with Hulk Hogan always on the lookout to relive one of his past feuds, it made all the sense in the world for him to convince Eric Bischoff to bring the Warrior in so they could have the rematch of the century. The only problem was that when he didn't have a promotion like WWF wrangling him in, it quickly became apparent just how bad Jim Helwig was as an in-ring performer at this time. And we're not just talking about the match he had with the Hulkster at that year's Halloween Havoc either. No, while this had since gone down in infamy as one of the worst bouts of all time, there are also the questionable promo segments Helwig was a part of during the lead-up to the bout. So perhaps it's no real surprise that, after only three matches with the company, WCW and the Ultimate Warrior would part ways before the year was out, with him from there going on to retire from the ring outside of a lone match he had a decade later. But not everyone who failed in WCW during the 90s was an ex-WWF guy. No, some came from the other notable promotion of the era, ECW. And of the people who did come from there, perhaps none failed as spectacularly as Mike Awesome. Yes. We're heading into that unfathomably bad period that is WCW in 2000, as it was then that Mike Awesome was signed up to the company. Obviously, this one is going to be bad, because as his time in Paul Heyman's extreme promotion had shown, he was more than capable of going in the ring. Really then, all then Booker Vince Russo had to do was to have him do what he'd been doing in Philly, take part in hard-hitting bouts which allowed him to get over based on his power and toughness but never underestimate WCW in 2000's ability to create a gimmick that's awful. And the gimmick that he first chose to give Awesome here upon debuting with WCW was that of the career killer. Okay, maybe this one wasn't so bad, as there was certainly some potential here. Unfortunately though, this original incarnation of Mike Awesome in WCW would be quickly changed to something a lot worse when he was rebranded as the Fat Chick Thriller. That's right, now rather than being an unbeatable tough guy, the Tampa native's character was that he was into fat girls. And it was only going to get worse from there because following this he'd be rebranded again, this time as that 70s guy, someone who had apparently developed a deep and sudden love for lava lamps and tie-dye out of nowhere. Yes, this one was confusing for many fans, as Awesome had totally strayed away from what made him a success in ECW in the first place. Would it really have been so hard just to play to the man's strengths? If you're the WCW booking team, the answer to that question is clearly yes. So instead of being a big breakout star then, Awesome became a footnote as his career was never able to recover from such a catastrophe. But for as bad as it was, at least people remember this run, and that's something which cannot be said of our next subject, another ECW alumnus who joined WCW at the turn of the millennium. Who are we talking about here? Why, the Sandman of course. Honestly, we wouldn't blame you if you forgot this one happened, as James Fullington, the man behind the gimmick, did so little after being signed up by WCW in 1998, he may as well not have been there. But perhaps this shouldn't come as a shock, because what were WCW going to do with the Sandman? 
After all, he wasn't the best in-ring technician, nor was he particularly great cutting a promo. And no, the most over thing about him when he was in ECW was his entrance. But with WCW not being willing to shell out the big bucks for Enter Sandman, even this aspect of the whole presentation was gone. And while hardcore wrestling was certainly a feature of WCW in 1998 and 1999, it wasn't on the same level we'd be seeing in Paul Heyman's Renegade promotion, with this meaning the Sandman couldn't even use sheer brutality to get fans onto his side. No, all he could do was flounder, as he began to look like a one-trick pony, with this trick of copious violence not being allowed in WCW. Hell, he didn't even use the Sandman name here. No, instead he went by the truly awful name of Hack. So now sounding like a chest infection come to life, Hack proceeded to have a few instantly forgettable bouts in the company's hardcore division, with this being all he did up until the point he was released from his contract in September of 1999. Was there ever a chance of this one going better? Probably not. So it just returns us to that same old question again, why sign the Sandman at all if you weren't going to let him be him? Well, like others we've discussed today, it was probably Eric Bischoff wanting to take away from the competition. After all, even at their peak, ECW couldn't come close to offering someone the same kind of money WCW could. Yes, this was a recurring problem for Paul Heyman throughout the 90s, as whenever someone got over, the bigger leagues started coming after them, luring them away with the promise of big money contracts. It's really not that dissimilar to what's starting to happen with New Japan today in the wake of high-profile exits like Kazuchika Okada, Will Ospreay, and Switchblade Jay White. Even as far back as the mid-90s, this was a problem, in fact. And we can say that for sure because it was back then Sabu went through his own failed WCW run. Now if you thought the Sandman's WCW run was unmemorable, then this one is on another level altogether, as pretty much no one talks about the time the death-defying maniac served a spell down south. And that's because it's such a footnote in his career, there's almost no reason to remember it. Basically, it started when, frustrated with the payouts he was getting from Paul Heyman, Sabu no-showed an ECW booking in order to do a date in Japan. And when Heyman fired him after this, he was forced to go look elsewhere for work, with this elsewhere being WCW. Needless to say then, the man known for taking part in only the most hardcore of hardcore matches didn't fare well in a pre-NWO WCW promotion, as there he was able to do precisely none of the things which had gotten him over in Philly. No, this entire run came at pretty much the worst time for the Staten Island native, as it was effectively WCW's PG era. So whenever he did hit the ring then, he proceeded to have some of the most paint-by-number matches of his career against opponents such as Alex Wright and Disco Inferno. And even when he did get a great in-ring performer to share the ring with, like Jerry Lynn, it was nothing to write home about. Perhaps it's for the best then that this whole period was a short one, and that by the end of the year, fences would have been mended with Paul Heyman. And we say that because if we had to remember Sabu for his time in WCW, and not his feuds against the likes of Taz and Rob Van Dam, we don't think he'd be considered the legend he is today. And the same could be said of our next subject too, because if he were only remembered for what he did in WCW, we can't imagine Jake Roberts would be in anyone's list of all-time greats. Why is that? Well, it was pretty bad all around, especially when you consider the level of talent Roberts has. After all, this is a guy who, during his run with WWF in the 80s, had turned himself into one of the most popular stars in the industry, someone who worked just as well playing the babyface as he did playing the heel. Need any evidence of why he was so over? Just watch some of his matches, or better yet, his promos. Yes, even today, Jake the Snake stands as one of the best talkers to ever do it, someone who can easily stand on the same level as a Rowdy Roddy Piper, The Rock, or more current day performers like CM Punk and MJF. It's just a shame none of this transferred over to WCW once he joined that company in 1992 then, as there, Jake was rarely given the chance to shine. Was this a result of his addiction issues already getting the better of him? Possibly. But that doesn't entirely excuse the company from dropping the ball so badly. No, even if the Texan was on a downswing at this point in his career, he still had a lot of talent and a lot of star power, as he'd only just come off a run with WWF. But rather than attempt to capitalize on any of this, WCW just chose to let him waste away in a series of terrible bouts such as the infamously bad coal miner's glove match against Sting at Halloween Havoc 1992. And by the time the year was over, he'd be cut from his contract. Fortunately though, Jake would eventually turn things around, all with a little help from Diamond Dallas Page of course, because as it stands today, he's doing great and has a gig in AEW where he serves as the manager for Lance Archer. Unfortunately though, the same could not be said for our next subject because he has since sadly passed away.
and that makes the fact Kurt Henning was botched so badly in WCW hurt all the more. Sure, you could argue the man known to WWF fans as Mr. Perfect had no right being in the ring towards the turn of the millennium as a back injury had left him a shell of the performer he'd once been. Hell, so bad was this injury he'd even cashed in his Lloyds of London insurance policy at one point under the guise of him retiring. But as with pretty much all wrestler retirements, this one wasn't built to last, and so that was how we got to a situation in 1997 where Henning decided to take one of the big money contracts Eric Bischoff was handing out to anyone who used to work for Vince McMahon. Yes, you could argue that it was a poor idea all around on account of his overall health, but even if he couldn't go like he had back in the 80s, there was still plenty which could have been done with a Minnesota native, as Mr. Perfect at 60% is still better than most of the wrestlers on their best day. But rather than try to use him to get some good matches out of younger talent, he'd mostly spend his time as a member of the increasingly bloated NWO, with this meaning that whenever he was on screen, he was usually overshadowed by about half a dozen other guys. Sure, he did get to have the odd good showing in between the ropes, but not nearly enough as a man of his talents deserved. And it wasn't as if the company even did anything interesting with him character-wise either, because once he was done being another face in the crowd of the New World Order, he'd start a group of redneck characters whose whole thing was that they hated rap music. And so it was then Kurt Henning and his crew of West Texas rednecks got into a heated rivalry with the No Limit Soldiers. And after that, he'd pretty much be reduced to the man who feuded with Sean Stasiak over the moniker of Perfect. That's right, no prizes for guessing this latter program came in 2000, Still, at least the WCW booking team in 2000 never got their hands on our next subject. Not that this makes his run in WCW any less of a failure, though. Who are we talking about this time? Well, who else but the big boss man? No, Ray Trailer's years in Atlanta would come between 1993 and 1998, right between his initial WWF run as a Golden Era Corrections Officer and his later one as Attitude Era Shield 1.0 member. And unfortunately, while both of these periods would be successful to varying degrees in their own rights, the same could not be said for his time spent down south. Why was that? Well, unable to use the boss man moniker on account of it being owned by Vince McMahon, Trailer was instead forced to settle for the Wish.com version of his own character when he started portraying the boss. And when WWF filed a legal injunction to stop the use of this gimmick, he'd instead be repackaged in the instantly forgettable roles of the Guardian Angel and Big Bubba Rogers. But things still hadn't reached their lowest low yet, because after three years of coasting on the fact that he'd once been on-screen friends with Hulk Hogan, any credibility the former big boss man had left was nuked when he was made the newest member of the Dungeon of Doom, one of the worst wrestling stables of all time. Hell, even when Trailer left the dungeon and briefly joined the NWO after that, the damage was so deeply done, no one could take him seriously anymore. So maybe that's why it was probably for the best he returned to WWF in late 1998 and there became a member of the corporation alongside the likes of Ken Shamrock and The Rock. It's just a shame not everyone we've looked at today were able to do the same.